Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it's uh, a great privilege for me to welcome you here today to the 8th Annual Deloitte J. Booth Lecture on Legal History. Just to say a few very quick words uh, about the lecture series, and then Deloitte will introduce the speaker and welcome to, to our faculty. Uh, just to say that Deloitte had this uh, burning desire to make sure that legal history is and remains uh, an integral part of Robson Hall's uh, uh, present and future. And I know he's on sabbatical this year, and it's very nice of him to come in for his lecture series. But uh, before going on sabbatical, he made me a, a guarantee in no uncertain terms that legal history would be taught this year, and indeed, Professor Tory is, is taking that class. And uh, just to emphasize his commitment to legal history within the law faculty. And that commitment is, is quite evident in his setting up a separate endowment fund and generously funding a lecture series on legal history that will continue on uh, in future years. We're at the eighth uh, annual lecture, and, um, and we envisage many more in the, in the future. And so even though it is legal history, it is going to be in the legal future of our, of our faculty. And just to say, I think we should congratulate Deloitte on his vision in ensuring that legal history does have its place in our faculty. <laughs> At this point, I will turn it over to Deloitte to introduce our speaker and welcome once again. Thank you very much, John. discovered old age does catch up with one uh, in terms of arthritis. Um, Donna Andrew, student of John Beatty, passed away just several months ago at the University of Toronto in the Center for Criminology. Uh, and Donna was one of group of about two dozen uh, of John Beatty's star pupils, PhD students. Um, and it's been a joy. Donna and I have never actually met until yesterday at the airport. Um, but it's, I've always followed her career. Like me, she is not a lawyer. She is a legal historian. She trained me the best that Canada can offer and could offer in the whole field. So her specialty area has been 18th century London. There is a superabundance of archival material for anyone who is interested in the case approach or the institutional approach to the study of crime and the way in which the law attempts to play a role in, dare I say, controlling it, or certainly in punishing it. And Donna's specialty has been, as you will note, uh, a minute or two, um, has been uh, a more arcane but socially fu fundamental areas of laws attempt to regulate human behavior and, dare I say, uh, moral, public 
just listening to the news, you know. I mean, Washington, D.C. is just awash, literally, with all these issues about how far public law should intervene uh, or play any role at all in what Pierre Elliott Trudeau referred to as the bedrooms. Uh, my God, we're getting all sorts of news every day of uh, that subterranean world. So this raises issues about the role of law and just public morals. But today, she's just going to focus on one aspect, and that's dueling. I'm sure she'll cover it. And in the age of Hamilton, uh, we're reminded of how central dueling is to our legal system. After all, the very essence of law and litigation is that two people have a conflict and they charge each other with opposite versions of the facts. And then, either with guns or swords or, in our age, perhaps just words, they duel, and they try to resolve the conflicts in that way. So the duel, two individuals um, confronting each other, and as will be in the law school, politely now call it conflict resolution. Um, it's damned, at, you know, take them to the mat, and uh, whether physical violence is involved or not, uh, who shall know? Well, we shall find out, <laughs> certainly for the 18th century, uh, because uh, Donna is here today. And with that, um, I, should, I should start before I read you my paper uh, with telling you something about the duel. Um, if people of different social, if men, um, we have no evidence of women ever fighting duels. It's an interesting <laughs> idea, but no evidence. Um, if, if men of different social statuses challenged each other to a duel or were challenged, they did not have to accept with no loss of honor. So you had to be of the same social status, and that's very significant, because it meant that men who dueled were almost entirely men of the upper class. So it's a very interesting, this is not my paper at all, but you should know this, uh, it's a very interesting um, attempt of the law to come to terms with their, the, the creme of, the, of, their, of their world and you can imagine the kind of conflicts that arose. Okay, my paper is called Scandal the Law and the Press, Attacking Immorality in Britain, Dueling 1760 to 1830, which I see as the crucial turning period in, in this event. Throughout the 18th and first decades of the 19th century, oh, by the way, if you can't hear me in the back, please just raise your hands, okay? Um, Throughout the 18th and first decades of the 19th century, clerics, moralists, and newspapers all bemoaned the continuation of what they described as a barbaric or gothic practice, the duel of honor. Again and again through this period, we read calls in the press for legislative action to stop dueling, to make strongly punish, to more strongly punish its practitioners, or to set up courts of honor to make duels unnecessary but nothing happened. No such new laws were made, no such punishments enforced. In fact, the punishments already available to the courts were seldom used, and most frequently the law turned a blind eye to the activities of duelists, even when death resulted. Yet public interest in the duel was obvious. 
and can be seen in the numerous dueling items inserted in the newspaper and magazine press well before 1750. Most of these reports were very short, however, and often do not me even mention the names of the duelists and their seconds or the reasons for the duel. At least one paper asserted that it was incorrect to do so, uh, since the meeting concerned the private honor of two private individuals, and therefore was not a subject for public action or publication. The prompter, an essay magazine of the 1730s, commented that, quote, since dueling is a private way of doing oneself justice, independent of law, the motive of such violent arbitrations of right and wrong between gentlemen ought not to be publicly entered into by any writer. It is also probable that the white, widespread use of omission fees made it both safer and more profitable for newsmen not to write about such conflicts. The practice of dueling in Britain during this period has attracted the attention of many historians, most of whom have used the 18th century periodical press as a source to a greater or lesser extent, me included, for obvious reasons. This is a secret event. Some have also offered arguments about what caused the disappearance of dueling by the mid-19th century. In this essay, I hope to offer another clue to that complex puzzle. Decades before newspapers in their news columns invoke the public, this phrase was found in advertisements addressed to and perhaps invoking this entity. By the mid-century, this phrase could be found everywhere. Even private letters could and did become transformed and available to this public when reproduced in newspapers. Quote, the public could be obliged with some observations on the late election in Westminster is one quote, or astonished with further tales of the famous Hannah Snell, whose surprising adventures have been the admiration of the public. Again, private news made public through appearing in the press. What is clear is that in its earliest and most inclusive definition, the public meant the collective body of newspaper readers. Dueling was an illicit activity. What this meant, of course, is that most people who dueled tried to evade detection, tried to conduct their encounters at out-of-the-way spots and at odd hours of the day. If the meetings did not result in fatal wounds, it is possible that they entirely escaped public notice. But for the 18th century, we do have a great deal of contemporary evidence that allows us partially to reconstruct what ordinary men and women of the time might have read and consequently thought about this practice. One of these best sources is the growing newspaper press. In this single phrase, the newspaper press, I include the monthly journals like the Gentleman's Magazine, the essay periodicals like the Tatler and Spectator, but most significantly, the growing number of cheap, widely available, and most extensively read daily, tri-weekly, and weekly newspapers like the Gazetteer, the Public Advertiser, and the London Evening Post. Let me take a break here and say that I was amazed and very pleased to find in one paper a note saying that many of the more ambitious pub owners had set aside a table in their pubs for men who could not read and hired a reader to read them the newspaper of the day in which they selected what they wanted, the kind of news they wanted to read. So even people who could not read, even men who could not read, had, had avenues by which they could come to this news. So the, 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 the waves spread even further than the people who could read. But can we read the newspapers as directly reflecting the number of duels that occurred in England during this time? There are certainly difficulties in doing so. Some historians choose only to use journal indexes to construct their databases. Other eliminate purported reports of duels as satirical, sometimes they might be, or refuse to credit duels that do not include the name of the duelists and their seconds. Given the problematic nature of these stories, therefore, this essay focus, focuses instead on the impact they would have had on the reading public. One can well understand why the dueling upper classes wish to maintain secrecy about these sorts of activities. Less worried perhaps by the law than the plebeian counterparts, they nevertheless felt demeaned and sullied by having their private affairs made public. 
commenting on the press coverage in the aftermath of Lord Byron's trial of 1765 for killing his neighbor in a duel, Horace Walpole, though clearly unsympathetic to the man and his cause, still noted that, quote, that, that though Byron, quote, escaped with life and recovered some portion of honor, if that can comfort him, end quote, it must have been a terrible ordeal, quote, after the publicity made of his character. While the spectacular nature of the trial, as well as the differing versions of the duel itself, made the event a media happening, equally interesting, perhaps, was the number of letters that the duel evoked and the dialogue that began within the press through such letters, both about this particular duel, but more about the practice of dueling in general. While three of the 11 letters published in the six months after the Byron duel were uh, concerned with the costs of the trial to the public, and all, all of the others were on the matter of principle, and several appeared in the front pages of their papers. Duels, especially those involving prominent people, were clearly of interest to the public, arousing all the salacious interest that the bad behavior of one's betters often exhibited. However, beyond the opportunity for delight and disapproval, newspaper reports of duels allowed the ordinary reader to know more about duels than he or she was ever likely to witness directly. This indirect observance of the duel would have helped to create an antipathy to the practice that the press often encouraged. It was a flurry of political duels, or duels fought for political differences, of the 1760s and 70s, featuring such notable public men as Wilkes, Fox, and Shelburne, which really made it impossible to conceive of dueling as a private activity fought for private honor. Newspapers also became much more important for the proper conduct of the duel. Unlike earlier reports of duels, from the 1760s onwards, it becomes more and more common to find both participants and seconds sending in their accounts uh, to the newspapers to inform the public that things had gone properly and in an honorable fashion. Rather than paying editors not to publish such stories, public men who dueled increasingly seemed to feel that it was imperative that their story be told correctly and that the public be informed of its true circumstances. Increasingly, the public was invited to view the duel to see how coolly and fairly it had been conducted and how the rules of honor had been obeyed. In addition to such accounts of these duels, many correspondents also sent letters to the press commenting on the protagonists, the desirability of settling political disagreements by such confrontations, and agreeing and disagreeing with each other, which papers did then and continue to do. Though the bulk of these letters and of most of the press comments were both partial and congratulatory, we do see views expressed, publicly expressed, not only by newspaper writers, but by their readers and correspondents, which raised serious questions about the rule of dueling amongst public men. By the early 1780s, there was some sense that such behavior demeaned the political process and was inappropriate in, quote, a certain assembly where good manners and politeness should form the basis of all debates which are there agitated, uh, language which in more common parlance we hear repeated today. Yet, when in the late 1790s, the Prime Minister, William Pitt, and the Whig leader of the opposition, George Tierney, fought a duel over remarks made in Parliament, the press seemed unwilling to con condemn them for it. Maybe because it was a great story. However, unexpected and troublesome to some, if prominent public men fought over slurs to their political honor and did so in an ordered, regulated, and approved fashion, Neither the state, nor the church, nor the voice of public opinion, the press, was willing wholeheartedly to denounce their acts. So through the second half of the 18th century, though there was an enormous expansion of press coverage of such rencounts, as they were called, that publicity seemed to have no effect on the number of duels that occurred or were reported in the press. An imprecise count of dueling items in the press suggests that the coverage increased by eightfold from the preceding four decades. So that goes from 86 such items uh, in the previous decade to 684 in the, in the following decade. 
In fact, some newspapers even suggested that a total ban of such reporting might serve a salutary purpose in reducing the actual incidence of dueling. Thus, the Whitehall Evening Post commented on the use of the press by the duelists and their seconds. Quote, it is not to be wondered at that the parties themselves concerned in modern duels publish their folly to the world in the newspapers. There are certain sorts of gentlemen, and that's underlined, who live purely on their bravery and gallantry. It is their estate in fee simple, and the credit of the world depends on the world knowing of their professions, exclamation point. For this reason, the Morning Post recommended, quote, as one circumstance which may contribute to bring dueling into disrespute, into, sorry, into disrespute, let no duel be mentioned in the public papers unless in the language of ridicule or contempt. And let no accounts appear as written by the parties, for it is a thousand to one that a little newspaper fame was all the combatants had in view when they pretended to quarrel. Many pressmen argued instead that their reporting of such events, not surprisingly, they argued that their reporting of such events revealed the horrific and needless violence of such affairs and would serve as a salutary preventation. Excuse me. Pre I spelled something wrong. Prevention against other con con others contemplating such action. Despite the inability to come to terms with dueling in the new century, after at least 50 years of trying, we know that dueling did, in fact, end in Britain. The question then remains, how, when, and why did this happen, and what brought it about? There is no simple answer, you'll be relieved to know, to this question, and the second part of my argument must therefore be just a suggestion of the overlooked importance of one growing communicative practice in the later 18th and early 19th century. The publication of duels stopped by the intervention of the law in the person of magistrates and their associates and the publication of court cases in which men challenged to fight refused to comply and instead brought their opponents before the courts. We have some small evidence for the use of both of these alternatives to the duel in the earlier 18th century. It's not a brand new thing invented in the later 18th century. Thus, in 1761, the Whitehall contained the following item. Quote, yesterday a duel had liked to have been fought by two captains, one in the king's, the other in the merchant's service, upon the dispute about some men being impressed out of a West India ship at sea which, however, was prevented by peace officers and each bound over according to the statute. A decade even before this, another paper, Old England, told of a duel stopped in the courts. Quote, on Saturday last, a certain person well known about the parish of St. James Westminster was brought to bar in King's Bench, Westminster Hall, on an indictment against him for sending challenges to two members of parliament. For all we know, these two practices of stopping duels may have been in use for many years. One has no evidence for duels that stopped. One would love to know what, how many of these were stopped and never hit the press or any other form of publication. That's just lacking to us. So I don't spend too much time talking about them, but you should have that in the back of your mind. Um, it is a growing press reporting, however, I wish to argue, which concentrated not only on the reporting of court cases in the interests of brevity, that publicly demonstrated not only that viable alternatives to the deadly meeting were in existence, but that men of honor and repute, men whose courage and public probity could not be questioned, were using them that made the imperative to do less and less pressing and persuasive. If historians of the law are correct, if 18th century courts were stages on which the power of the state was performed, then newspapers, in their reporting of these legal challenges to the code of honor, acted as amplifying devices, as um, sort of like that, uh, for the dissemination of charges, of changes, sorry, in the stance of the state toward dueling. Sorry, must take a... There were generally three different sorts of courts to which these complaints could be brought. 
If civilians were involved, the cases appeared in King's Bench. If they involved military men, they were often treated in court martial proceedings. Or if the challenged man was an MP before the House of Commons. When two landowners, for example, came into conflict about local land usage and one challenged the other, this case was taken to King's Bench. When Lieutenant Edwards in the drunken state challenged his captain to a duel, he was court-martialed at Plymouth and broke, i.e. lost his position in the Navy. Finally, when Theophilus Swift challenged Sir John Rotsley to a duel for his role in the contested parliamentary election, Rotsley invoked parliamentary privilege and had Swift tried before the House and imprisoned. While the first of these venues was the most common site for cases and of newspaper accounts, the report of the court's proceedings was sometimes abbreviated and incomplete. In only about two-thirds of the reports do we get a sense of what the court's initial role, ruling was, and only in a minority can we follow them through to the sentencing. However, their very appearance, the copious reporting of arguments made by prosecuting attorneys who represented the challenged party, and the very extensive inclusion of the judge's comments in themselves may well have had a significant impact on newspaper readers. These are things that one would love to be able to quantify, to have more punch to, but that's the best I can do. Though the, we have newspaper accounts of challengers being taken to court before the mid-1780s, they were relatively rare. There are only four such notices before the 1750s and 60s, and only six in the 1770s. By the 1780s, the numbers climbed to 28, escalate to 62 in the 1790s, and level off at 65 at the first decade of the new century. So there is a definite growth in its reporting. After a rule for criminal information was granted in King's Bench, it could then be appealed or made absolute or referred to another legal tribunal, to the master of the rolls, or to the grand jury. If, however, it was made absolute, there were various possible outcomes for the parties involved. It is clear that both King's Head Bench and the House of Commons preferred to settle these sorts of cases amicably and favored those who would either apologize for their offense or make some sort of out-of-court settlement. However, if that proved impossible, the courts used fines, sureties for continued behavior, and even imprisonment to lessen the threat of a duel occurring. In many of the earlier cases before King's Bench, the challenged man brought the letter sent him by the challenger or by his representative, which were the proof of the offense, since challenging to a duel, as well as actually fighting one, was against the law. In the course of time, not only did King's Bench start punishing the bearers as well as the authors of such letters, but the very nature of the evidence became more subtle and less explicit. Eventually, the courts no longer demanded the standard phrases in these notes, quote, the satisfaction of a gentleman, which meant to do, of course, or the time and place at which a meeting was to occur, but began to recognize quote, unquote, implicit challenges, and even took into account communications which they deemed were prov provocations, that is, letters that were so insulting that the receiver would either accept a forthcoming challenge or even better still, become a challenger himself. You know, your mother's dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and all of this appeared in the press, and especially when Lloyd Kenyon, chief justice of that court between 1788 and 1802, would provide remarkably detailed coverage of his closing comments and views, as we shall shortly see. Not only did these reports become more detailed and voluminous, but in the 20 years from 1785 to 1804, they greatly increased in volume. While the number of such reported cases for the 15 preceding years, 1770 to 84, were 15, 19 such reports appeared in the next five years. Between 1785 and 1805, 107 cases were reported of challenges brought to court, and the reports were usually found in several of London's most widely sold newspapers. Though there is a falling off thereafter, there is at least some evidence that these 20 years were the crucial period for the beginning of the end of dueling. Using the Times 
the Digital Times of London, and the London papers listed in the 19th century British Library newspapers as rough guides. We see that in 1800, these papers reported the occurrence of 14 duels and eight that had been prevented, either by the magistrates or in the courts. By 1820, the same number of duels had taken place as, as had it been nipped in the bud, 12. By 1830, while five duels were reported, 10 had been stopped and were covered in the press. There are two additional reasons for believing that the activities of the law, as well as the publications of those actions by the press, may well have convinced potential duelists to consider other methods of conflict resolution. The first, with the size and nature of the penalties imposed on those challengers brought to court who are unwilling to apologize or allow for external mediation. Challengers found guilty by the courts could be fined anywhere from 50 to 1,000 pounds with a 100 pound fine the most common sum. This is a substantial amount of money in, in the 18th century, if not now. They also had to provide substantial sureties for keeping the peace, going from 100 to, two, uh, from 100 to 2,000 pounds from their own pockets, plus two outside bond, bond, bonds for a like sum. Probably the most unpleasant punishment the courts meted out in some cases, however, was imprisonment for a specified period ranging from three weeks to two years. Imagine an aristocrat going to prison uh, with the most awarded six months in jail. These extremely unattractive punishments must have borne especially hard on men who considered themselves gentlemen, men of honor, and better than the hoi polloi. The second effect of the publicity given to cases of lawsuits against challengers was the example they set to a wider newspaper reading public. Here I will only discuss two of the most notable of such, the suit by Lord George Cavendish, brother of the Duke of Devonshire, against a former captain of the Devonshire, Dev sorry, Derbyshire militia, of which Cavendish was the head. And the second suit brought by General Coote against a Major Armstrong at whose court-martial he had testified. In the first case, when Cavendish refused to meet his opponent, John Bembrick, on the field of honor, the later attempted to provoke Cavendish into an armed conflict by insulting him at the opera and widely posting him as a poltroon, a coward, and a scoundrel. Less than two weeks after the publication of Cavendish's court case, an anonymous correspondent who signed his letter, anti duelist commended Cavendish's action, noting that, quote, you can only wish your lordship to enjoy such thanks as mine, which I am sure must also be the wish of every rational man who looks with horror at a system of dueling. I trust your lordship will ascertain how far the law will protect a gentleman against abuse, and I consider your appeal to the laws as a more effectual means of preventing this detestable alternative of dueling than all the logic that can be used. In the second instance, when Major Armstrong, angered by the required testimony of his superior officer at, a court, at his court-martial, challenged that com commander, General Coote, to a duel, the king himself intervened and ordered his adjutant, adjutant, I can't pronounce that word, adjutant general to send a letter praising the conduct of the senior officer in bringing the case to court. This letter, which Erskine, the prosecuting attorney, read, noted that his majesty had seen this matter in so serious a light toward the army that his commendation was to be sent to and read aloud in every military camp in the country. Direct monarchical involvement and publicity in such affairs was surely very unusual and gave newspaper readers some sense of what their ruler thought about military dueling. But perhaps even more effective were Lord Chief Justice Kenyon's repeated and most widely quoted summaries at the suits of the sort over which he presided. Again and again, Kenyon noted as a conclusion, at the conclusion of such cases that the man challenged had, quote, acted with great propriety in appealing to a court of justice. When Lord Bruce, brother of the Duke of Aylesbury, brought a challenger before Kenyon, he said that Lord Bruce, he, um, Kenyon said that Lord Bruce had acted very properly in the steps he had taken. When the challenger attempted to mitigate his offense by noting the contretemps which had occurred at a family wedding when he, un he was understandably intoxicated, Kenyon responded that the defendant ought to know that an offense so serious was not to be shifted off by such excuses. <laughs> 
The final comment in this regard must be left to one of the most gifted legal practitioners of the day, Thomas Erskine. As prosecuting attorney against a man who had challenged and assaulted his client in attempting to provoke him to a duel, Erskine noted that not only had he, but, quote, the noble and learned judge, before he was speaking, had occasion to lament that one could hardly look into the newspapers of the day without seeing the sad effects of private quarrels. This trial, Erskine argued, would give Kenyon the opportunity of doing that which seemed to be the great object of his justice, to make the justice which was administered in that court an improvement on the morals of the public and beneficial to the public comfort and tranquility. If his lordship, by his, his wise administration of the law, should be able to dissuade men of that which seems to be the great object of his justice, to make the justice that was administered in that court an improvement on the morals of the public and beneficial to the public comfort and tranquili tranquility. If his lordship, by his wise administration of law, should be able to dissuade men from risking their own lives at the expense of the dearest interests of their families, he would do that which the wisest nations have done. He would put an end to the, a custom repugnant to morality and inconsistent with the positive laws of this and every civilized nation. While dueling did not end during the Napoleonic conflict, despite what had been said, nor with the war's end, despite such optimists as Reverend William Butler O'Dell, the who said, the officers of the army do not often fight duels, much had changed in a piecemeal and unplanned fashion over the previous hundred years. Duels were no long, now no longer private, but public affairs, thanks to the ubiquity of the newspaper press and the appetite of its readers for reports of these sorts of battles. And by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, again, thanks to the publicity afforded by press coverage, more and more of even such men were using the law, the magistracy, and the courts as alternative venues to the fighting field. Dueling had not ended, but its imperative, its power, had waned and could be, though it was not always resisted. Thank you. No, it was never. If it was brought to court and the defendants were found guilty, and they weren't always found guilty, I mean, they were seldom found guilty, you see. That's the problem. Uh, but if they were found guilty, uh, then they could be imprisoned. Uh, I've never encountered a case where uh, they were executed. They may have been, but it wasn't reported in the press. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm just wondering, do you see much of a parallel between uh, modern-day uh, hockey fights <laughs> and dueling? It seems like we've kind of uh, revived the... This, this is when I'd like to have my husband standing next to me. He watches hockey games. I do not. Uh, I'm a historian uh, because the, the present makes me feel uncomfortable. So I'd rather not talk about it. <laughs> it's much easier to, to talk about a period that one does not live in. Um, I wouldn't be, I don't know. I really don't have a clue is the short and true answer to that. Yeah, Very interesting I, question. I, yeah, I just thought, I, I, listening to you talk, I could see that we, we accept that hockey players can fight and assault each other um, within the confines of a, an arena and the public comes and watches and they, they assault each other for various reasons because they think they've you know, been treated unfairly or something. Our, our, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Are assault, assaults ever stopped? Uh, yeah, at, well, at times they are. Well, in that case, serious if, damage probably hasn't been done. Yeah. And that's, okay, that's one of the risks of the game. Mm -hmm. Whereas duels 
if possible, one of them wants to kill the other. If they only wound, that's not really good enough, but they, they really are there to kill each other, mm -hmm. or one is there to kill the other at any rate. Uh, so it's more at stake, perhaps. Yeah. That's the best I can do, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. I have two, two questions, and that is, what kind of conduct usually um, precipitated a duel? Oh. And did, the, and, and, and then my second question is, was the object always to kill the other person, or and did they usually achieve their objective if it was to kill? Um, it could be almost anything. It could be women. Um, it could be uh, gambling debts. It could be someone said something. Uh, you know, he's he's a nasty man or he's a coward, and, and their friends reported it to him. It could be anything. Uh, it was usually verbal. Uh, it might be a punch in the nose, but that the press didn't re tend to report that. Um, it covered a range of things. Um, now, that's part of the first an question. And the it second question. Was the objective question, death? Or did it usually result in death? Um, was the objective to kill? Yes. The objective was to kill. It sometimes res resulted in wounds, uh, of which, knowing a, a little bit about 18th century medicine, uh, I would say the results were more often death than not. Um, but, you know, the press lost interest in reporting those cases. And uh, probably there's no way of finding out. And there might be, but it would take more work than even this audience had time for in their lifetime. So I, I haven't followed that. Yes? Uh, you mentioned uh, dueling amongst the aristocracy. What about the royal family and the royal court? Well. Aristocrats who were members of the royal court uh, certainly dueled. Uh, I've never encountered a case that was reported in the press of, uh, of royalty who fought. If they fought, and I don't know whether they fought or not, the evidence does not exist. So like so many things that historians do, there are large black holes, you know? If there, if there is not evidence that has come down to us, there's nothing we can say. Hello. Um, did you run in your experience to any many cases of lawyers, barristers, or judges engaging each other in duels? No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had a quick question. I, just listening to you and looking at the idea of criminalizing conduct that's based out of perceived honor crimes, uh, slurs, things of that nature, and I can't help but think, is there a um, correlation now with them trying to uh, prosecute for these things. In the 19th century, the development of the defense of provocation, uh, going to the ideas of honor, you know, someone doing something as a slur and so forth, and right. that, of course, bring murder down to manslaughter. But I was wondering if there's a correlation. We recognize that, um, okay, they used to duel. <laughs> we used to just allow it, then we started prosecuting for it, but then realizing these issues of honor were so intrinsic to the society at the time that we want to at least give some partial defense to it. I can't wonder, help wonder if there's, that was part of the development. Well, it may well be, and that's work for the rest of you guys to do. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, to read the newspaper press is, is a very, very intensive yes. uh, activity. I'm really only interested in where people do to kill each other, yeah. uh, and that was obvious. They, kill, they dueled with guns, they wanted to shoot each other, and if not to kill each other seriously, wound each other and reclaim their honor. They may have used the law later on in the same way. And that would be an interesting follow-up. And I recommend, you know, I'm open it up to all of you. I'm an old lady, as you can see, and don't have long enough time. Uh, this took about, um, about 15 or 20 years of work. So, you know, anyone who's got 15 or 20 years to waste, uh, welcome. Is there anybody else? Yes, um, my question would just be, uh, were there many or much at all reported of cases where one or both parties to, to the duel would deliberately not try and kill each other, like fire in the air or fire far wide or sort of just to prove a point rather than actually trying to kill them? Would that have been legally relevant if they got later charged? Or I've never run into, into such a case to such an account in the press. It may be the press decided it was boring to print that. Well, there's no way of knowing, you see? And 
it's a really interesting question. And that's the trouble with history. We can only report on things. We can only use things for which there is evidence. And evidence is, you know, it comes and goes. Um, so there's enough evidence to prove that there was often dueling of certain sorts, and that's what I talk about. But uh, there, there, may have, there may well have been things like that that never got reported for obvious reasons. You know, who cares? And then just, oh, here Thank you for your talk. Um, I was intrigued by the portion uh, of the paper where you described what happened at the pub for people that couldn't read. I was wondering if that was mainly the lower classes. And I was wondering if you saw sort of an analogy uh, between that practice and kind of the rise of tabloid journalism in, in modern times. Well, uh, no. Um, because um, the question really came, I mean, um, it's, when I encountered that, I was stunned, first of all. I didn't recognize that that pub owners were clever enough to realize that there were people who came to their pub to drink who would really like to talk about what was going on in the world but couldn't read, and who were willing to put money into you know, setting up a table for such people. Um, and and uh, I mean, they'd sit there and drink, so they made some money out of it, but, uh, and providing someone who would read for them. So that, that stunned me, and I think that's a discovery of mine. I've never read about that before or since. Um, but, and if any of you ha have noticed someone else who, who's found that, I'd love to know. Um, but, um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I have no idea. It's, it was just a small, dis a small notice I found. And how widely it was used and in what context it was used, it's not much talked about. Now, I do have notices um, of something sort of similar um, of men who, who read newspapers to their wives, who can't, obviously can't read. And they read the kinds of things their wives are interested in. So I've also worked on adultery in the 18th century. And their wives are fascinated by adultery cases. And the man writes into a newspaper saying, my wife who couldn't read asked me to read her any adultery case I came up. up. And so I read her the case of. You know, and, but one gets these cases by accident. And, and you know, when, they, when, you, when your eye hits on them, you, because none of us can read you know, every word of all of these papers. We have to sort of go through looking for what, what is likely to be evidence. So when you, when you hit on a nugget like that, you're really pleased. And it may be that this, in fact, uh, happened more broadly. I suggest it. I'm not going to rest too much on that. Uh, I, I was just wondering if in the newspaper reports, is it kind of apparent um, the sort of transforming standards of masculinity and, you know, I'm thinking like Marty Wiener and, and the kind of arguments about the declining tolerance for violence, public violence across, you know, all of us. I mean, does that kind of, kind of jump out in the depictions, uh, of kind of more middle class notions of masculinity and that sort of thing against these kind of elites that are less deserving elite in some No, ways. no, 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 no. no. I mean, um, you know, the period I'm talking about is a period that ends about, uh, say, 1820, 1830. Uh, it's the old-fashioned ideas of masculinity, I think, that are still largely in place. Maybe later on in the 19th century, more middle-class notions of public, of, of the proprieties of public masculinity come into, into focus. But I've not run into that, you know, that men should stay at home and help their wives. and None of that, none of that. Uh, so, you know, it may be there, and it, I may have missed it, but I, I don't, don't think so somehow. Thank you. That's an interesting idea, though. Is there anybody else? That's great. Thank you. Um, the, uh, oh, yeah. Doesn't need it. <laughs> <laughs> presentation 
focus on newspaper evidence is um, uh, wonderful. One name that doesn't come up is, of course, Henry Fielding and his brother John, the blind, both magistrates in the eight, late 18, uh, sorry, sorry, 1740s and 17, uh, Fielding dies in 52, I think, yeah. 1752. But the, uh, Fielding was a systematic failure as a newspaper proprietor. And the magistrates, the connection between press and public magistrates is just the dominant theme uh, throughout uh, the 18th century. Fielding, when you go to London, the, go to Bow Street, and the Bow Street runners, and Donna's supervisor it, it was the king of knowledge for the Bow Street runners. Many, many things. Yes, but for the Bow Street runners and the Fieldings, um, this in informs us of the um, really intense public concern about what we think of as petty crime. Uh, and so the magistrates would run their own newspapers. Uh, and of course, what sells crime better? All you have to do is go to the supermarket today. Um, what sells newspapers is the crime, the petty crime. And the whole psychology behind this and the way in which our provincial courts and our police um, and our ministries of justice uh, are not only complicit, but uh, I might suggest promoters of this kind of public awareness. After all, it does wonders when a budget time comes around um, for gaining a bigger cut of the pie. And J. Edgar Hoover was certainly the founder and master of that tactic in the United States. But when you re read Fielding, um, you get this great sense of the um, interconnectedness of crime and just general normality and what is considered to be normal behavior and how much tolerance there is within any culture, ours now or the 18th century. So, uh, and the newspapers are literally, well, shall I say dime a dozen? We'd say a farthing a dozen. He's a hugely rich, literate cultures as well. And all pubs have them. Yeah. All pubs have them, yeah. then and now. But this, this uh, huge industry of newspapering going in and out of existence is true in Canadian culture certainly up through World War II. And we now have reached a point where in North America, certainly, and in Europe, uh, all that is gone, everything is centralized and monopolized uh, by uh, syndics, syndicates, so forth, so that we have lost it. But anyone here who has dipped into pre, say pre-1945 Canadian stunned by the sheer numbers of newspapers that go in and out. Many of them uh, uh, serving just local cultural units. But three or four, in Winnipeg alone, in the, in, between the wars, uh, huge numbers of newspapers. Uh, for the Jewish community, Mennonite, Ger German, uh, whatever. 
Well, I should have made that clear. So, I'm only looking at London newspapers. You know, London is yeah. the biggest, biggest part. Yeah. And only London newspapers, and there must be, you know, my, and it's an interesting point. I, I didn't give, there are dozens of papers going in and out, and, uh, you know, they're, they're quite pleased to be able to publish uh, such stories because uh, they're like, they're like uh, divorce stories. Yeah. You know, stars, 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 and illicit activities. Uh, people want to read this stuff. So. And behind the scenes, uh, and I'll finish with this. Behind the scenes, there we, we see, thanks to Donna's work um, and the whole criminology center for Toronto, for Canada at least, we see how we have to redefine crime. We have to redefine police powers. We have to redefine our expectations of public authority and private resolution. Um, and maybe end with the thought that perhaps it's time to revive the duel. <laughs> to revive the private resolution of disputes, but the one thing that we're guaranteed is that it will catch everybody's eye when you're at the at the um, uh, checking out stand of our um, supermarkets. And so on. So, uh, any other comments that come to mind or anything? That was just wonderful, Donna. I mean. Because it opens up the whole world for us and forces a comparative mentality on our part of then and now. Well, you know, uh, just to end, and this sounds like a plug for my book, and it is sort of. Uh, <laughs> I look at, at a variety of vices that are all sort of interconnected uh, and that were all massively reported in the, in the press. Uh, dueling, gambling, suicide, which of course is a crime in the 18th century, and adultery, and um, you know, and and this 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 constellation of crime um, was was very very, and it, it it sold as you can imagine as as our papers sell today when they're reporting the breakup of of you know movie stars relationships and and. I mean, people have this in, in, in insatiable desire to find out who's doing what with whom. And the press feeds off and feeds to uh, this, this uh, desire. Um, so, um, you know, there it is. Right. Well, let's really thank Donna. Thank you.